Hey, Elliot. Wait, hang on. Oh, there we go. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, I can hear you now. How are you doing? <laughs> uh, great to see you. It's good to see you. Too long. Welcome. I know. Welcome to like the most gloomy day in Providence ever. Um, it's absolutely downpouring. How is it in Bloomfield Hills? You know, honestly, until you almost literally the second that you got on the uh, the Zoom call, it was almost exactly the same. But you've brought you have brought uh, beautiful sunshine, as you can see here in in the in the uh, in the back. Doing what we can. Got to keep like a little bit of joy at the end of the semester, you know. Right on. Yo, I'm realizing I totally forgot my co cup of coffee, so I'm just going to take you with my AirPods into my kitchen. It's all good. It's all good. And grab my coffee. Uh, what, is, what is that in the upper left-hand corner? Oh, shit. The, this, this one? Yeah, hell yeah. That's what I'm why, why it's an Elliot Earls. Sweet. <laughs> I'm yeah, got to keep some like fluorescence in the back corner for the zoom zoom vibe for sure. We're still waiting on uh, a few people. We'll, we'll wait until um, we'll wait until about ten. Or I mean, until like two or three after. So I, oh I, yeah, no worries. How you living, man? What's going on? What's popping? You know, just trying to survive at this point, which I think is a common human expression. Um, Lindsay, hi. I feel hey. like all sorts. Of... <laughs> How are you doing? Doing well. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's sort of like, I mean, to be very candid, we're in the final two weeks at RISD. And so it's just the absolute like rodeo show, um, which is simultaneously like the best part of the semester because everyone's very tired, but we're all coming together, reflecting on everything that's been done. Um, but it's also the point in the semester where everyone is very, very stretched thin. And we're kind of forgetting moments of self-care and things of this. Um, so if I'm a little bit scattered, please forgive me. I've already had a number of meetings this morning, which is part of the difficulty of teaching in a pandemic, which is I have students that are currently in Hong Kong, in Beijing, Pakistan, India. And so I'm teaching twice a day uh, for my students that are in 12, 13 hour different time zones. So I already taught class once this morning. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to avoid that. Yeah, with my uh, with my oldest, Henry, as you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that the, I'm hoping that the school that he ends up going to is in person, I, 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 I don't, I ain't trying to spend $70,000 a year for some, for some Zoom meetings. Yeah, I like to think we've done well, um, but RISD is definitely a hands-on studio culture. Um, the tricky part was our students just couldn't get visas half of the time to come back. Um, but <clears throat> our provost just announced we should be in person for fall. I'm getting my second vaccine on Thursday. Could not be soon enough. Let's go. <laughs> um, definitely missing it, which I think some of the images I show will show me missing the studio for sure. Right on. Um, all right. Well, I think we'll probably have we'll probably have one or two people uh, still join us. Um, but hey, I mean, it is great to see you. As I, as I spoke to you on the phone yesterday, uh, I don't really, in these Zoom meetings, I think one of the great things is that uh, I send links out prior to, um, or a link or research links out prior to the, um, prior to our meeting and ask the students to do, do, do a little bit of research. Uh, but they're familiar. I, 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 believe it or not, I talk about you a lot. So they're, uh, they're probably familiar um, with uh, with your work, and um, the other thing is that I like to look at this as just uh, an informal conversation. You can talk about whatever you we discuss a number of subject matters that would be appropriate or not appropriate, but that might be interesting to talk about. Given that you're a, an esteemed graduate of Cranbrook Academy of Art, the two D department, you're one of our own, 
And so I think that you'd be in a position to give some advice. One of the things that I'm really interested in that with a lot of the Zoom discussions that we've had uh, with our guests that, that I've asked about is how to <clears throat> extend your practice beyond graduate school. You know, I think that's one of the, one of the I think that that is one of the major issues. And uh, the students would not know this about you, but you're extremely, you're extremely high energy. And, um, and you know, one of the lasting impressions that you that you left with me as a graduate student, and it it really is a kind of, uh, it's a to my mind, it's a kind of a rule of thumb for really honestly how how to have a career, how to be successful, how to make a mark, is I would turn around and you'd be in the you'd be in the sculpture tall space, and you would have been in the sculpture tall space for <clears throat> for three days with scaffolding that you had either erected or rented or whatever, and with like $2,000 worth of vinyl, installing a you know 20 foot by eight foot vinyl uh, typographic installation. And, and I thought, look, that makes a fucking impression, man. And uh, so needless to say, um, your teaching career as well as there are other aspects of your career post Cranbrook have, 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 been, have been very interesting. So I, so I thought, I thought one, you know, one possible topic that, that again, I'm acutely aware of because I think that the, the, I know I just said this, but the most important component I think of graduate school is, is, to, is to consider how, how these things that we're dealing with, how they, how they translate into, into one's life, you know, how, how, how this stuff actually makes its way into a life. And I think that you're a, you're a kind of, you're not a kind of, you're a living embodiment of that. And I can see the seeds of that in your work as a graduate student. So, I mean, you can feel free to talk about, talk, talk about anything that you'd like, and we can take anywhere from, from five minutes to about to anywhere, you know, uh, anywhere in the hour and 15, hour 20 uh, range, and uh, the floor is yours. Well, awesome. It's really nice to hear you say that, Elliot. I mean, I think part of when Elliot calls you and you you like pick up the phone and he's like, yo man, can you come to the studio tomorrow morning? Might you say some words? Um, that sense of community and family is part of what, even in the midst of chaos that I was mentioning that we all are living in right now, it's part of why you say yes, because there were moments Elliot always told me yes or gave that time. And I think sort of that relationship that you build in your graduate career matters. And so I've prepared a little bit because I am a type A control freak, if we also might be very candid. I see someone nodding. And so if it's cool with you, Elliot, there's a couple of things I'd like to do. First of which, this is the first time I'm seeing a lot of your faces. And if you wouldn't mind, I'd appreciate if we might just take a moment to say hi and like how we're doing today inside this space. Um, and then the second thing is I've dumped some images inside of a folder I've done a little bit of a read me, maybe 10, 15 minutes for me to talk through that I think might help frame the way that we have this discussion of what do you think you're doing inside of graduate school and how does your understanding of that sequencing change in your experience outside of graduate school? And then I think I can be of most value talking about that transition with you all today. Um, and then also talking about teaching as a practice or as a studio pursuit. Um, does that sound cool with folks? I see folks nodding. I have you up on a giant monitor, so sorry if I'm not looking directly at the camera. So if it's cool with you guys, I would love to like meet you a little bit before you meet me. You know what I'm saying? So um, if it's good with everyone, maybe we could just say names, popcorn around the room. I know you all know each other, but I don't know you. Um, and if you wouldn't mind giving me like preferred names and pronouns, um, that way we can just communicate to each other how we want to be communicated to. Um, so I can start. Uh, my name is Kelsey Elder. I use he, him. And then maybe we can add in where we're calling from. So I'm in Providence, Rhode Island right now. Um, I'm going to pass it to my right. I'm a sequence and order and structure person. And to my right is Megan, I believe. Hi, um, I'm Megan, and I am in Birmingham, Michigan. Um, yeah, let's see, I will pass it to Lauren. 
Hi, I'm Lauren. Um, I use she, her, and I'm in Bloomfield Hills in Mustinho. I'll pass it to Ed. Hey, my name is Ed Ryan. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and I'm currently in Waterford, Michigan, um, because I took my shop or my car to the shop this morning. So I'm waiting for that. Um, I will pass to Peter. Hey, I'm Peter. Uh, he, him. Uh, I'm in the annex, the 2D annex right now. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, enjoying the, the breeze. Uh, I'll pass it to Rens. Hey, I'm Rens Xu. Uh, I'm in Beijing now. Uh, I'll pass to uh, Kaya. Hi, I'm Kaya, she, her. I'm also in the annex right now, and I'm interested to know which studio you had, Kelsey. You'll see and some Im images, yeah. <laughs> Did you have one by the kitchen um, or by so the sink? I used to be in the annex in the room that was like two rooms next. I don't know if um, the head of architecture still has a studio over there, um, but there's like a little hallway. You walk in the door, a little hallway. My desk the first year was right to the right. And then I don't know who has luxury studio inside the main building. Um, I see so, someone nodding, um, but I had Nicole Killian's old studio. I don't know if like legacies of studios continue to be remembered. Sean's Nick. studio now, yeah, Sean. Okay, yeah, sick, down there. <laughs> cool. And I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Kai, I cut you off. <laughs> Oh, I was just going to say, I'll pass it to Shen. <laughs> Hello, good morning. I'm Chen. I come from China and I just got my second shot of vaccine on the Sunday and I had a little fever, feels bad yesterday, but I'm back. I'll pass to Kate. Hey, Chen. Um, I'm Kate. I met you while you were actually here at school um, a few years back when I was still indecisive about coming to Cranbrook. Um, I use she, her, and I'm calling in from Bloomfield Hills, but I'm at home today. I need to pass it. I'm sorry. Um, Michael, you want to go next? Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Michael. Um, he, him. Bloom for Hills, second year studio. Pass it to Jay. Hey everyone, I'm Jay. I'm also in the annex enjoying the breeze like Peter. Um, yeah, enjoying the time at Cranbrook, he, him, Alex. Hi, I'm Alex, she, her pronouns, as with many others, I am in my studio, and I will pass to Lise. Um, good morning, um, Lise, uh, they, them. Um, I'm in the annex, but um, mentally I'm in Florida, and I will pass it to Katie. <laughs> Hi, I'm Katie. Um, I. I go by she, they. Um, I am also in the annex with Peter, Kaya, and Lise, but I am originally from Chattanooga, Tennessee. I will pass it to Lauren. Did you go? Oh, uh, oh, geez. Uh, Lin Lindsay? Yeah, I think it's me and Elliot. Uh, I'm Lindsay. Hi, Kelsey. Uh, uh, she, her pronouns, and I am in the basement in the print. I don't know what it was when you were here exactly, probably workroom. Um, but yeah. yeah, so it's, we pulled the print room out into the workroom kind of. So there's like tons of printers and stuff. And then I'm kind of in that corner. Uh, and then I'll pass it to Elliot. You're on oh, mute, my friend. You're muted. I think. I got a problem. This fancy microphone. I have a problem with my technology. I'm Elliot. I go by he, him, and I am uh, Zooming to you today from Milan, Italy. <laughs> does that bring us to everyone? I believe it does. 
Awesome. So I know that's a cheesy um, way to start. Oh, um, I go did it. Sean go? I was going to say, did Sean go? Oh, sorry, Sean. Yeah, uh, I'm Sean, currently at home, pronounce he, him, yeah. on the, the luxury studio right now. <laughs> Well, thank you everyone. Since I'm hoping we can end this in a dialogue, even though I have little Zoom names on your screens, it's helpful for me to just know how to call you and how to sort of meet you on your level. So I do appreciate that. And it is nice to just connect names with faces right now. Um, and so if it's cool with you all, um, I dumped some images in a folder after Elliot called me. Um, and I think it might be helpful for me to just have a little bit of a narration about my time at Cranbrook and then kind of how the last six years have shaken out. And I'm hoping maybe we can end it um, in a dialogue, if that sounds good. So does that sound good with everyone? Awesome. I am a teacher. I'm good with like physical feedback. And then at any point, you should feel free to like cut me off, scream into your microphone, tell me to shut up, drop stuff in chat. Uh, let's make this a festive uh, Tuesday morning, if we will. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen right now, and hopefully I don't lose all your faces. All right. I did lose your faces, but I can make them bigger. Is everyone seeing a desktop right now? Yes. Sick. Yeah, fine. Awesome. Yep. <laughs> yeah. All right. So here we are. Um, I, try to, I tried to do something informal, Elliot. I really did. We'll see how it goes. Um, but hi. <laughs> I'm Kelsey Elder. Um, there's an image of me. You'll be able to tell how far into the pandemic we are uh, by how long uh, my hair has gotten since this photo. Um, I'm currently uh, coming to you uh, from Providence, Rhode Island. We like to call it Little Roadie. Oops. Um, so here's Providence. It's a beautiful state. Um, I've been here for the past three years, um, along with my wife, uh, who is also named Kelsey. And fun fact, we both went to Cranbrook. Uh, we're high school sweethearts. We both went to undergrad together. Here's us last summer exploring beautiful Rhode Island. Um, in addition, I'm in Rhode Island with my two cats. This is Ami, um, one of my teaching assistants, and then Link, my other teaching assistant. Um, and like I said, I'm currently a professor at uh, the Rhode Island College, uh, or excuse me, the Rhode Island School of Design, AKA RISD. And I love this image that one of my colleagues took the other week, which sort of is the epitome of trying to teach hybrid and like radical imagination from sort of uh, an administration level. You see me over here uh, with a little document camera Skyping to my students in Beijing while a couple of uh, current project for students are here. Um, and so it's been a difficult uh, past couple of years, um, but I'm always reminded of this image that I took last spring when we all went remote. These are my grads um, that are currently graduating today. And this is the first time that we saw each other on Zoom uh, since we all went remote. And I'm constantly reminded to circulate images of joy and happiness inside of these uh, really turbulent times, uh, because I think the more that we come together, the fostering of community, and the more that we make space and uplift each other, those are really the powers of graphic design. Um, and I, at RISD, faculty colleagues. I also love this image, which is one of the first faculty meetings that we had when we were remote. If you notice, it's actually my wife calling in, and then I'm behind her. And then we're also seeing the images duplicated. And so one of the joys of going remote, doing these Zoom things have been, how do we foster senses of community, being together, and belonging when our bodies are uh, like physically vacant? Um, and so to kind of go along with this, since this is the first time we're meeting, um, I think three quick facts might be nice. So if I wasn't a graphic designer, I would most definitely be maybe a bread baker. Oops. Um, I love understanding how things work. I'm particularly interested in sourdough. Like before the sourdough craze of the pandemic started, I've been baking with my mom for quite a while. 
I have two different starters that have been my family for like the past 30 years. I love making bread. I share it with my students. Another fun fact about me is I'm a complete card nerd. Um, and so in undergrad, my senior project, my thesis, if you will, was the formation of a small company called Lowered Values. We're part clothing company, part custom garage. And I've ran this company for about the past 10 years. Typically during summers, we tour around to different car shows. Uh, we sponsor them with a pop-up shop. Um, but we also build custom cars for clients. And while most people who build cars wouldn't call it experience design, it's 100% what I'm doing. We're thinking about the thrill of the object um, and how we can imbue meaning inside of it. Um, and so here are just some images uh, from two summers ago, because obviously all car shows were canceled last summer, of our pop-up shop um, and some cars that we've built for clients. Everything that we do is made in-house. Um, some more images. Um, and one of the things and why I'm showing this is because I think a through line, something I was never able to articulate during my time with you, Elliot, was how important actually space and community was for me. I just never synthesized it together with graphic design. Um, and for me, my company was kind of the first one where I was like, oh my gosh, like maybe one of the things that I love about graphic design is bringing people together that have different types of skills uh, to form some sort of team or some sort of collaboration that's greater than the sum of any of those individual parts. Um, and so for me, Lord Values is sort of this wonderful mix of experience design, community building, um, and then object making. Uh, over this winter, uh, to try to adapt to the pandemic, I tested my waters in web design. It's a simple cargo collective, but making a new website for us with the CMS was a big thing uh, for someone who is rather handy and more apt to weld something than code something. Um, and the other thing that I sort of want to mention um, is I'm a very active uh, member of the CrossFit community. Um, I'm a coach at a local gym. It's one of the only inclusive gyms in the Northeast. Um, this is an image from a couple about a month ago during the CrossFit Open, which is a worldwide competition in which the top 10% of athletes continue forward to the games. So cro CrossFit is like part uh, gymnastics, part uh, weightlifting, um, and I love it because it's a test of bodily skill. Um, and I was lucky enough to advance to the semifinals. Um, inside of this, I'm actually the uh, ranked third for trans men worldwide. And I say that because I think as you move forward, as you interact with graphic design, um, it's really important for you to foster senses of community, to find teachers that are different types of teachers in different aspects of your life. Bell Hooks talks about this. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but for me, interacting with the car community, interacting with the CrossFit community uh, forces me to interact with uh, different types of individuals that I might not otherwise and learn from them different types of teaching. Um, and so other than that, um, let's kind of get down to the crux of this thing. I've always been interested in how things work. I think that's why I love cars, why I love baking, especially why I love CrossFit, because it comes down to sort of like bodies and abilities. Um, and I'm especially interested in how typographic technology impacted languages and how we manifest visual modes of communication. And so since leaving Cranbrook, some of the ways I've extended my practice is through writing. I speak at type conferences. I specifically research about how typographic technology intersected civil rights in America. We see things like photo lettering and the digitization of type co-currently co occurring with those movements. Um, I'm sorry, I just keep pressing the wrong thing. Um, and so here are some images from just sort of like that, that stuff. Um, again, one of the ways I've extended the practice is through writing, speaking. Um, I'm just a big type person. I think letter forms are absolutely magical. One of my favorite things to do is make cards for my mom or for loved ones. I think an audience of one is very powerful. Um, just selection of images. I do a lot of drafting and things by hand. Um, 
but I also do these things professionally. So I did this lettering for uh, the 154 gallery for um, uh, Nancy Mutiti uh, and Black Chalk. Um, and I also think about code or programming as another way of scripting language or scripting content, scripting form. This is a prototype for Tao and the Get Down, Stay Down, uh, the song Temple. Um, I did this last summer uh, with her, um, just thinking about different ways that audience might be able to engage with lyrics, music, uh, this sort of thing. This uses P5.js, very, very simple tool. Um, I also uh, like building gravity generators or physics engines. Um, and so one of the great things that I've done is begin to sort of collaborate with uh, people that know a lot more about code than I do. Um, and so this was with uh, Lin Yoon and Kevin Yoon uh, building a physics generator um, akin to matter.js, which is a JavaScript library, um, but sort of picking it apart and building a library uh, by hand. Um, and so this is all a means of or why I'm showing this is a means of showing a way of thinking through the idea of translation or contending with a material through different modes or different tools. And so whether or not it's vinyl or a hand cut card or a piece of programming, I love type because it's a thing that you can study throughout a lifetime. Um, there's a couple more sketches. I don't think it's worthwhile to kind of go through. But the other powerful thing about programming is tool making for individuals and communities who might not have access or the ability to afford things like Creative Cloud or Adobe. And so one of the other things I'm doing since leaving Cranbrook is using uh, the collaborators that I've grown or uh, interacted with um, to create tools for remote communities. Um, and so this is with a Jay Archer uh, working with uh, communities in Trinidad and Tobago um, on sort of like a custom uh, branding um, uh, toolkit for them, if you will. So a way of choosing colors, making it say something and be able to export, you know, a sticker and image uh, for uh, Instagram, if you will. Um, I love thinking about type in different states. Um, and so I'm specifically interested in how variable font technology is really likely going to become the next thing that impacts the development of human language and our ability to make the typographic letter more accurate or accessible to the experiences of everyday life. I also have extended my sort of practice from Cranbrook, which was really focused around type um, in very professional ways. This is a typeface for a children's book publisher that I've been working on for about the past six months. Very classical Roman, it's still being drawn, um, but this is to show that I consider sort of fluidity between when it's for studio practice, when it's for a client, when it's for my voice, when it's for someone else's. Just a couple images of meager as it's being drawn. So, you know, I think it'd be most appropriate today to discuss more so my path to teaching and a little bit of general reflection and perspective following me graduating Cranbrook 2D in 2016. Um, and for me, um, Cranbrook was really the only option. Um, I like to say I had already drunk the Kool-Aid. At Cranbrook, as I'm, I'm sure some of you, oh, I see there's a chat. Absolutely, Adrian Lenker. I have a massive crush on her. Um, I'm a huge Big C fan. Um, and if you haven't seen her interview with KEXP um, about her process and recording um, of songs and instrumentals, it's beautiful. I didn't realize it was a completely analog process. I'm a huge music head. So before going to Cranbrook, I worked at Rhyme Series Entertainment, uh, which is a record label in Minneapolis, which is part of kind of the uh, music stuff. But if you want to get down on Adrian, I'm totally down to have that conversation. Um, at Cranbrook, I started to do kind of large scale uh, typographic installations. Um, Elliot mentioned me. I mean, frankly, Elliot, I took out a loan to do this work, which is maybe not recommended. <laughs> um, and so um, 
but it's true. I was like, you know what? This is two years. It's two years I'm going to be really selfish. Elliot sometimes had to remind me to smile and be friendly to other folks. Um, but I did kind of go about it in a little bit of a competitive attitude. I wanted to make the biggest, brightest work I could possibly could. Um, and I knew that it was a special moment inside my career to make work that I probably wouldn't be able to do otherwise. And so despite probably best financial advice, I absolutely took out loans to make this work. Um, which are still being deferred. Uh, thanks, Biden. Um, but I did begin uh, sort of playing with type, scale, um, and materiality. And this was really a moment where I started to understand the potential of the letter form surface uh, to house history, to tell someone's history, uh, to engage with others, um, the ability for it to be sort of a veneer slick. Um, where someone could engage with it or understand it on one level, but perhaps if you were inside of a community of practice and speech, specifically a trans or a queer community, you might understand some of the language in a different way. I think it's a fallacy to make work that can appeal or communicate to everyone. Um, so here are some images of that big one inside the sculpture space, about two stories tall. And this continued to sort of my thesis scope, which was centered around a typeface um, which aimed to archive letter forms found on Woodward Avenue. Um, maybe a sort of separate story for another time. Um, but at this time, I was really investigating the potential of letter forms, um, how we can imbue them with different meanings, customization, um, the ability for them to carry language and materiality. And talking towards about how this work extends past Cranbrook, I still get hired all the time to do large custom vinyl work. I've done one or two every single year since leaving Cranbrook. One of my favorites or one that I wanted to show was at Pub, Pub, Plug Projects um, in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, and it was a show for called Moderation as a Memory. And this is where it sort of links back to Cranbrook and the family, uh, if you will. This was a joint show between myself, Nicole Killian, who is a graduate of the department as well, and Bev Fresh, Zach Ostrowski, another uh, Cranbrook homie. Um, and it was a way of sort of in initiating a dialogue between all of our work. Um, these things are about 15, 20 feet high. Um, and this was sort of a first time I wasn't necessarily using one of my own typefaces, but one of my buddy, James Edmondson from Ono Type Foundry, as he was drawing out, out obviously. It was kind of a perfect typeface thinking about the ghost signage of the, the American landscape um, and the value uh, uh, sort of inside of them. Some images of that. Um, I also continue to actually do a lot of work for folks that I met somehow throughout uh, the, my Cranbrook time. I did a website for Brittany Nelson, who is a graduate of uh, the photo department. Um, and I worked on this with my wife everything was coded by hand. We included all of these sort of like little um, gifts or woodland creatures um, in embedded a drawing tool. They got married during the pandemic. And so the idea was to create a website um, where people could send them letters that became unlocked after their uh, ceremony at the town hall. And so people sent them a bunch of like terrible cockroach drawings. Some of them sent some like really well wishing, but the idea was to create kind of like a special uh, box that would be able to send it to it. Um, and so let's talk a little bit uh, more about that idea of like, I had already drank in the Kool-Aid, Cranbrook was the only choice for me. In undergrad, I had mentors who came from Cranbrook. And so while I was aware of things like Yale or CalArts or other graduate programs, I knew that I wanted, frankly, to study with Elliot. And I, I say that because I was very smitten with everything that happened in the early 80s uh, and, and sort of into the 90s at Cranbrook. I'm a huge fellow fan. Um, I thought a lot about sort of the P. P. Scott legacies, the McCoys. Um, and I knew that I felt like I was born at the wrong time. Like I wished I had existed at Cranbrook in the eighties during the rise of desktop publishing. And I say that because at the time I just didn't realize that the same typographic technologies were happening right now. We just couldn't see them. Um, and so I'm starting to understand since my time at Cranbrook that while I was infatuated with the rise of desktop publishing and the democratization of typographic tools, those things are still happening right now um, in terms of like variable fonts and sort of open source um, and open type. Um, 
And I do think in the next 20 years, we'll look back fondly in that same way. Um, but like I said, I'm kind of like maybe a unique case. I went to Cranbrook with my wife. Here is us in the 2D courtyard with one of our cats. Um, and like Elliot said, you know, I think it would be curious for you to have maybe spoken with one of my undergraduate mentors who probably would have qualified me as an absolute recluse, someone that didn't talk to anyone else, uh, didn't engage with the institution or the academy at all. And I didn't do that because frankly, school was never made for a body like mine. I felt very fearful whenever I entered class. I was always worried about being misgendered, called out. Um, at this time, and frankly, over the past, until years recently, I've never talked openly about being trans. And that was largely due to safety. Um, I wasn't particularly passing. I didn't necessarily identify these ways, um, but I knew that I wanted to leave school in a better place than I had found it and for others to feel safer inside of it to the best of my ability or power. And so while I was at Cranbrook, um, and what I wanna highlight right now is my engagement with the institution and with my peers and how that affected sort of my trajectory into teaching. So at Cranbrook, I was studio uh, council president uh, with Kimmy Parker, who is one of my graduate uh, colleagues in 2D as well. Um, and during this time, we initiated a bunch of town halls and did do a little bit of work to uh, force the institution to contend with systems of dominance or supremacy. Um, although I didn't understand that that was what was happening at the time, again, I was just mostly focused on what was happening inside my own studio. But even looking back inside of the image folders, I was realizing that a lot of the work I was doing was collaborative, like the image you see here, which was over 15,000 hand placed sequence, uh, which is a collaborative uh, work from me, uh, my partner, Kelsey Dusinka, and a woman in sculpture named Johanna Hare. Um, you can kind of see the scale of it here. I became really aware that the best ideas came through collaboration. Um, here's an image of sort of my studio uh, in the annex, I believe, um, which progressively got messier the further along I went. And while my personal practice was investigating um, letter forms as sites of significance, I think underscoring all of this was ideas of collaboration, leadership, um, and an understanding that the people that I was surrounding with actually actually started to matter. Um, and so I mentioned that because um, my past six years have really been earmarked uh, by people um, that I either graduated with or did end up going to Cranbrook. Um, and I didn't expect to what extent that might end up mattering, um, but it sure has made me feel more welcome in different spaces that I might have not expected myself in. And so actually in Cranbrook, I had this like little bit of an idea that it was like, wow, I really wanna go work at the Walker or like, I would love to go work for Pentagram, or like Will Fallins, um, but like I'm doing weird fucking shit. And like, I really don't think that that's going to be an appropriate portfolio to send to these folks. And I was doing traditional book design, as I'm sure all of you are, um, inside of the reviews. I really honed into making them all um, sort of like an addition, using different typefaces, sort of uh, always really loving the process of writing, uh, sitting down with work. And the further out I am, I realized that it doesn't really matter what I made inside my own studio, that this was the process and the mechanics and the procedure that it was actually of maybe most value inside of my graduate career um, because it forced me to think critically and generously about someone else's work. Um, and I think that uh, the thing I valued most uh, from my graduate experience is in it finding words to articulate and finding words to see and observe others' uh, movements. And I think that has really affected my ability to teach. Um, so here are just some images of uh, kind of the reviews and stuff I did. But like I said, um, I actually uh, also sense that the other thing of value was the community um, and my peers. Many of the people in this image I continue to stay in touch with. Um, I just love sort of that, that. And like I said, I was still doing like books and things like this I, as a book I did with Elliot. Let me just kind of flip through because I'm sense I'm getting lost. Um, but upon graduation, like I said, I had a slight understanding of that the work that I was making was not necessarily appropriate for maybe a studio context. Um, but it doesn't 
mean that it couldn't have been. I just sensed that part of what I was understanding was the reason why I went to graduate school was because I was very frustrated at Rhyme Sayers. I was tired. I was considering what, like, what am I making? Why am I putting it out into culture? What does this ultimately mean? Um, and a lot of my colleagues were contending with these things as well. Um, exiting Cranbrook, um, I was recommended for a two-year appointment at the Virginia Commonwealth University as a designer in residence. And I was recommended by another Cranbrook alumni, uh, Nicole Killian. And this was my first uh, teaching appointment. Uh, very, very foundational. Um, and I just love this image because if you can see my mouse, here is David Shields, the head of the department, Cranbrook alumni, I think 1982. Here you see Laplay. No, no, he, gra he graduated a year after, no, he was 1994. Oh, okay. So I didn't mean to make David older than he is. Okay, um, just, he's all right. Perfect. Um, so, you know, the head of the department was a cranny. My uh, office colleague Laplay was a cranberry. Here we see Nicole Killian, another Cranberry. Here we see Wesley Taylor, another Cranbrookian. And I began to realize that um, if you look around to different departments across the United States and abroad, you see a lot of Cranbrook legacy impacting pedagogy and curriculum across the United States. And this image that you're seeing here, maybe I'll flip it to the next one where we see LAP in a nice, nicer state. Um, we were developing curriculum that would be able to work in both uh, VCU Richmond and VCU Qatar. Um, and this was a really formative first teaching experience. Um, Lap and I were sharing an office together and because we were rewriting curriculum that would be able to be sustained over 10 years, um, we were also sharing a lot of ideas. Um, and so I think at this time, I began to realize that actually Cranbrook was a way of understanding how to study. It didn't have anything to do with graphic design and maybe even less so about articulation, but it had to do with learning and studying. Um, and these were mentalities, this hunger, if you will, this thirst for knowledge, this curiosity was something that drove me to teaching and really caused me to love it. And so at this time at BCU, we began to pass around text, which quite frankly, I couldn't believe I hadn't encountered before, like Bell Hooks teaching to transgress, I'm gonna drop this right now into chat in case others are interested, or maybe I'll do that here at the end because it's not letting me drag and drop. Um, and teaching community, a pedagogy of hope. And I began to have this sort of new world of thinking critically about graphic design and the way I operate applied to uh, teaching and power structures inside of the institution. And so I love this quote um, from Teaching Community, uh, which discusses the role of critique. Um, and in it, um, Bell is discussing when we only name the problem or when we're only negative, when we only state complaint without constructive focus on resolution, we take away hope. In this way, critique can become merely an expression of profound cynicism, which works to sustain dominator culture. And this was the first time I began to understand uh, graphic design's relationship to supremacy, dominancy, um, and perpetuating systems of inequity. Um, and it was some of the first times that I began to hear words like love, hope, and justice being applied to a classroom space and freedom. Um, and I became very interested in this utopic idea of teaching and the radical potential that lies within it. Um, and so again, at PCU, I was at a public research institution where we were encouraged to bring in uh, radical ideas inside of the classroom. Um, and I also was teaching subjects in which I loved. I was teaching experience design, type design, and history. I was working with amazing uh, students who were holding me quite accountable for my actions and words that I chose. Um, and like, please forgive me, but I had a little bit of a moment just going through like finding some wonderful images of the first time teaching. And I'm, I'm like becoming very aware of like how young I look uh, pre second puberty, um, if you will. Um, but I became really interested at BCU at this idea of um, education as a practice of freedom, seen uh, from bell hooks. Um, and inside of this gesture was a conundrum for me as well. 
which is even uh, those of us who are experimenting with progressive pedagogy practices are still afraid to, to change. And here is sort of at VCU, I was starting to realize like whether or not I was continuing Eliot's pedagogy or if in fact I was creating my own, which is an important moment of recognition to understand. When you leave graduate school, you're so embaked with what you just saw of so much value and so much of action that sometimes you forget to synthesize it against what you believe in or what's useful inside of that context. Um, but I kept returning to this idea of the most vital and radical thing that we can do is to build community um, in places of resistance, whether or not that's inside of education, inside of a car community, inside of a CrossFit community. Um, and in that sort of way, I began to realize that um, the community of educators I surrounded myself with mattered a lot. Um, and I started to realize that if I wanted to continue to teach, that teaching afforded me a lifetime pursuit of studying. Um, and it was at that moment that I decided to go back to school again. And I applied to the University of Reading uh, to do a typeface design uh, program. Um, and so here you're seeing me with the University of Reading. We see Jerry Leonidas right here. We see Fiona Ross right here. Um, and it was an amazing uh, opportunity to get a really different type of education that was research-based, uh, based on documents, histories, ways in which language is written, ways in which technology impacted culture. Um, and I really cherished uh, this other uh, sort of form of an upper level education uh, focused on letter forms. But what I found was I keep cycling back the images of food together coffee together, ways of just having dialogue together in unexpected spaces. Um, and sort of during this time, I became increasingly aware of uh, me wanting to continue to teach. My appointment at VCU was only for two years. And so at this time, um, I quite frankly sent out, I think 20 to 25 applications. I was made a finalist at about six and offers of those as well. Um, and I knew I wanted to continue teaching. And so I took an appointment to continue teaching at a public school uh, at the Purchase College of the State University of New York. And at this time, um, I was more convinced than other that the last place that graphic design can truly be radical is in its education. Um, and teaching, um, oh, just some more images of Reading. I'll maybe skip, skip these. Just go down to SUNY. Um, the magic of teaching exists, I think, wherever you go. Um, but the thing that I learned most at the State University of New York was what I needed from an environment in order to be fulfilled. Until this moment, I had been pouring. And I realized how important it was to be supported or filled back up so you can continue to engage the reciprocity um, the, the, the scene and equity of labor. Um, and so the magic of teaching kind of exists no matter where you go. Cranbrook people followed us into New York as well. Here we are doing a studio visit with Jess and Tanati um, at Ralph Alpabaum Associates. Um, and the only moments I was very happy at Purchase to be very frank um, were moments in which I was reconnecting with former students, like you see here, or when I was finding those places to come together with uh, individuals. And at this time, I was uh, still speaking, doing type engagements. I was invited to do a queer uh, educator panel um, that was facilitated by Nicole Killian, who you see right here. And it was the first time I met Ramon Tejada, uh, who was teaching at RISD at the time. Um, and I knew that I wanted to um, I needed to leave uh, Purchase College if I wanted to continue to teach. Again, there was just a inequity of how much someone was giving and how much someone was taking. Um, and it's really hard to be inside of that dynamic. It wasn't a really good fit for me, um, but it was a really good learning experience to understand what I needed from a school in order to succeed. And at this sort of spring moment, it actually would end up being my third application and my second offer to teach at RISD. And the thing that I'm showing a screenshot right now, Paul Suella sent me this email. He was head of the search committee and I had never felt so wanted to be really frank with you and to feel like I could possibly belong somewhere. I had felt seen after my interview. 
Um, yeah, I mean, Paul is just brilliant. Um, and so I made the transition uh, to come up to teach at RISD. Um, here is us meeting our new graduate cohort um, in the beginning of 2019. Uh, you see James Goggin right here, Lucinda Hitchcock, who is our department chair, and all of our wonderful graduates around the table. Um, I began to realize really quickly that the thing that was lacking at Purchase for me was this sense of family, the sense of connectedness, the sense of seeing each other outside of that space that I think happened at Cranbrook due to like being inside of that like weird little bubble together and like you never leaving and sort of like, um, I realized that I needed that from a sort of space. Um, teaching here has its challenges. I think a lot of people frankly expect RISD to be quite privileged, but I was really um, surprised on sort of my on the ground experience. Yes, some of our students come from uh, backgrounds of immense privilege, but uh, many do not. Um, and there's a really beautiful uh, space of co-creation created um, when faculty get along um, and encourage students to prioritize community care and rest as well. Um, and so I'm just showing this because at this point in my life, while I have a professional practice and I run a company, I do identity and branding work, I do super graphics for clients, my practice is actually becoming my teaching. And I think my success, Elliot, I remember you telling me, you can judge the success of a teacher um, by the, their students, if you will. And that really sort of like resonated with me. And, and, and so as I've moved into teaching, I've realized it doesn't matter what I'm making or producing. It matters how I'm creating space for others to succeed within and how I'm setting up the conditions for that to exist, which is why I think I'm so interested in CrossFit, right? Like you make progress and gains by everything happening outside of the gym. And so when my students come into my classroom, the first thing I ask them is if they have eaten and if they have slept, how are their bodies feeling? Um, and this is a place of like radical disruption, I think inside of institutions. Um, and so like my, my teaching experience has, at RISD has been quite formative, um, but it also has been perhaps the most uh, exhausting experiences I have ever done. Um, this is for a number of reasons, the first of which is actually contending with the responsibility of a graphic design education. Um, and what I mean by that is how do I balance my belief uh, with the radical power of design education to disrupt or Trojan horse patriarchal capitalist power structures with the present needs of my students, their increasing burdens of debt, fear of inadequacy of skills, entering turbulent job markets, and their health and well being? There's a really big schism between the utopic values of graphic design and the real world community realities that our students find themselves in. Um, Institutional labor is like another really big one, um, which I don't think I was expecting as a young teacher entering uh, the field, which is most often your adjunct and term appointments are doing the most work. So for instance, you know, I love my job at RISD and I don't wanna say anything like that, but I've been uh, solely responsible for creating four courses, which is hundreds of hours. I, I actually like weighed the amount of documents that I had to create to create those courses. And it was over a thousand pages. Um, and so like, I kind of wanted to drop it on the Dean's desk and be like, here is sort of like my value and sort of document weight. Um, and then of course, the other side of it is a, a pandemic um, and understanding how to transition one's teaching practice into a new, new tool. Um, I think the barriers to change, uh, the dominance and supremacy in graphic design are complex and even more so in its education. Like I mentioned, the lack of financial resources, overworked faculty, staff, and students. Um, all of these things are creating breakdowns of trust between community groups, which is never a good thing. Uh, there's too much unmet financial need, too little emotional support, too much inequity of labor, burden on junior and term appointments, but, the further along I go in teaching, the more so I believe more than ever that inside of education is the last remaining territory to be radical inside of graphic design. Um, and the more that I teach, the more that I actually understand that um, authority comes from participation and constant change rather than having definitive answers or solutions. Um, in this way, it's process-based, it's limitless. 
we talk about the periphery, um, but Camila, Janine, Rashid uh, recently changed my mind about what the periphery means. And perhaps there is no periphery or no bounds. Um, and all of this preface is hopefully to sort of uh, serve as a space to create some dialogue about like teaching, ways of moving forward, hopefully a little bit of a storyline through it. And I wanna leave us uh, with this Donna uh, Haraway uh, quote from Staying with the Trouble. Um, and I'd like to just sort of read it um, as a way of us thinking about ways of moving your practice forward uh, and, and how you can um, maybe continue to enact some of those values, questions, and concerns you've been having inside of your practice. In urgent times, many of us are tempted to address trouble in terms of making an imagined future safe or stopping something from happening that looms in the future of clearing away the present and the past in order to make futures for coming generations. Staying with the trouble does not require such a relationship to times called the future. In fact, staying with the trouble requires learning to be truly present, not as a vanishing pivoting point between awful or endemic pasts or apocalyptic or salvic futures, but as mortal critters entwined with a myriad of unfinished configurations, places, times, matters, and meanings. Um, and so I love this idea of staying with the trouble, that the act of being present or inside the moment can be a moment uh, of radicalness. Um, and so I hope that was mildly coherent um, as a little bit of a trajectory. I have to be really candid. I've never, let me go ahead and like stop screen sharing so I can see your faces a bit bigger and you can see mine. I've never put together anything to share in such a compressed timeline. And so I hope that was okay. Um, but I think like maybe what would be nice to sort of begin discussing is, you know, how does one contend with uh, moving a practice forward from a graduate space? For me, teaching afforded me the ability to say no to clients I didn't have values that aligned with. Um, and um, I had this sort of unlocking potential understanding of like, man, like you can't really get outside of the capitalist agenda <laughs> um, inside of that client uh, designer dynamic. Um, and I'm not saying institutions don't have the same thing, um, but I think in order to enact change, you have to start at kind of like a grassroots level. And at least inside of design, that means working with like kids high schoolers um, and inside of upper level education spheres to enact sort of the future that we wanna see, um, which sort of ends with uh, Chiro Escobar talking about the idea of the pluralverse in which how can we design uh, or create educational spaces in which many different universes, many different narratives can exist. Um, so I'm gonna be like terrible in which I don't really have like a question to start dialogue with. Um, but I hope maybe we could continue uh, these ideas of like how you move practice forward or the mess of it um, and how you don't lose your soul uh, inside of that searching process. That, can I like talk about something that I'm like grappling with? Um, so something that I've been grappling with is I do want to become a teacher in the long term. But as a disabled person, like I need a lot of medical care. So I'm reliant on corporate jobs or sorts of jobs that can actually provide me with insurance and healthcare. So I've been grappling with those two different things and trying to decide whether I wanna sell the, my soul to the devil to be able to stay alive and stay healthy and well, um, or like, I, I don't know what that will look like in the future. So that's something I've been really considering in, in moving my practice forward is, how do I stay rebellious while still getting the things that I need? Because we do live in a capitalist society where Unfortunately, in the US, we're determined to have healthcare through our companies instead of through the government. So that's something I've been thinking about. I don't know if anyone else is freaking out any of the other second years. Are other folks contending with this as well? Um, in a different sense, like health insurance is a thing. I don't um, have the same concerns that Kate does um, in terms of like health insurance, but I would definitely say that's a thing. One thing that I do just want to like have a discussion about is I think it's really important that we talk about how this world is um, capitalist and patriarchal, but I also think it's really important to acknowledge it's a white supremacist ca capitalist patriarchy. And um, 
yeah, just like the way that we like understand patriarchy, the way that we understand capital and capitalism is really from this, um, this white supremacist European kind of Euro American perspective. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that as well. Yeah, thank you. And I think, you know, I totally agree. So maybe I can bounce off of Kate first. Um, in a environment of production where value is seen correlated with um, like modes of production, performance um, and rigor, I hate that word. Um, I think one act of actually uh, radicalism is ideas of self-care, mutual aid, um, community support. And so if I'm hearing your concerns correctly, I might propose that um, nurturing oneself in a context that supports that can be a disruptive act um, or an important act. Um, I also talk to my students about like the idea of Robin Hooding, for lack of a better term, where potentially we work with uh, clients or scenarios or inside of a job uh, sphere where um, it allows us to undertake other types of community work or community engagement that helps make us feel more full. Um, and I also could, uh, from my own experience, say that um, having differently abled individuals in different positions inside of institutions do have large amounts of change for how institutions interact with quote unquote historically marginalized groups. And so I'm on the spectrum. Um, it's always been very difficult for me to understand social dynamics. It, it's part of why I think like grad school was very good for me. Um, and so I, under, I can understand it from sort of that point of view. And then, uh, was it a Alex? Alex, yes. Alex, you're absolutely right. And so I failed inside of my notes to, add, to put the word white supremacy and I absolutely should. Um, graphic design is, at least in my opinion, and I think in terms of writing, um, a, f a, f um, a system which perpetuates white supremacy and dominance culture. Um, and we see it not only in terms of uh, the professional field, but in terms of the academic sphere as well. I contended, I'm still contending with my legacy of education um, in the pursuit of equity inside of my classroom. Um, and so I don't, I don't have any, I think like my best, I don't really have, I sense there wasn't a question in, in that I'm not intending to defer other than to say, you're absolutely right. And part of my past six years has frankly been an ability to see um, what wasn't said uh, inside of my academic education. And these things were absolutely never said inside of my academic education. Um, and that is, I think, a, a failing of the academy in different ways. Um, and for me, this has meant um, learning how to listen to not, like learning to listen to listen, not to speak, right? And so um, I like being a teacher because I can force the institution uh, to contend with situations in different ways, but I, I consider the role of an educator as a space maker, right? Like I am, and I think this brings up the other tricky part of being an educator, which is the uh, trickiness of indoctrination uh, versus exposure and sort of all of these things and how only teaching from one set of values or philosophy or standpoint um, is also, um, could lapse into indoctrination, which Bell Hooks discusses as like another form of white supremacy. And so that's been something I've been recently contending with, which is like, oh man, like if I'm only talking to them about the utopic values and ideas of graphic design, am I in fact indoctrinating them without their ability to form values or ideas on their own? And so 
teaching, I don't think ever gives you solutions, but it gives you space to continuously be curious to know um, and continue to learn, uh, which I've realized like I actually really love about graphic design is it's a space to ask questions and continue to learn. And one of the biggest uh, vulnerabilities I think most professors have to contend with is to say that we don't know because historically we're meant to know. You know, like that archetype, the baggage of teaching, the baggage of the institution is like the institution knows and you're here to know. But that mentor apprenticeship model is like needs to be absolutely dismantled. Um, did, did I like, like, was that no, like, yeah, no, there yeah, wasn't, wanna, like, I want to like get into this. Question. Yeah. No, there wasn't a question. I mean, I think your practice is really interesting, but, um, I think that I have also been this year, a majority of my practice has been organizing. Um, and I also had like another writing practice outside of Cranbrook that I've continued, but I also think it's like very interesting that most people probably in this department or at this school don't know that I've had this big organizing practice or they know about it, but don't know explicitly what it is because I have not done really any organizing for white people it's been predominantly like people of color and racialized people and then black people within that, um, which is kind of a very kind of like just specific agenda that I've had as my practice. Um, but I think that I've been thinking a lot about some of the things that you've been, that, that you brought up um, in your talk. And I, um, I just find a lot of times that um, even kind of people um, that have responses similarly to yours, they don't quite, um, they say that things are like patriarchal or they say that things are capitalist um, or they'll just generally blatantly say that something is racist, which isn't wrong. But I think it's also for me, it's been really important to develop language to articulate how and why and to break those things apart. So that kind of, um, I didn't mean to like jump down your throat if it sounded like that. But I think for me, we're um, no. <laughs> pointing specifically to this idea of like white supremacist capitalist patriarchy has really been important to kind of um, is a way to trace the history of how we got the ideologies that we currently have. Uh, absolutely. We contend in graphic design with the power of language in nearly every aspect of our field. And so, uh, I mean, this is some, this is a conversation conversation we're currently having at RISD, I think most institutions are, which is like, how do we name uh, our bias and in, in sort of uh, our own personal values in the classroom? To be really honest, a lot of institutions tell you to be Switzerland in the classroom, right? Like, we're supposed to be neutral, we're supposed to be non-political, we're supposed to like accept all ideas, but that that's complacency and that isn't good either, you know? Um, and so the other thing I hear you sort of picking through is I know for myself, I've had to defend to the academy. I don't mean Cranbrook Academy, I mean institutions, uh, the defense of like queer work, uh, which typically uh, seeks to not name itself or uh, camouflage itself. It's definitely not for the provost to be reading. And one of the things I've struggled with is how do you um, show value uh, to an external community of work that you've done? How do you couch it in the language that they want? You know, and it's so something I've never quite figured out. So like when I mentioned like wanting to drop on the desk of the Dean, the 10,000 pages or whatever I wrote for the course development, the institution doesn't want to hear or see these things. Um, and so these are, you know, I think like, the best way I can respond is this what is what makes me really excited about the creation of like alternative schools, alternative institutions. I think about Exodus School, um, which one of my former grads, uh, Taylor uh, Stewart, just formed, uh, which is a black only uh, graphic design sort of alternative institution. Do you, she's from Detroit. I don't know if those folks have intersected. Um, she's part of like uh, design justice and that sort of space. Um, but I think uh, graphic design has historically been object-based. Um, and so it makes the quote unquote soft practices, the organization, the community, the soft skills of listening, understanding and observation uh, harder to defend because graphic design has always been able to name an object 
to see its aesthetic value, uh, to contend with it. Um, and I think graphic design is now contending with the idea of a non-object-based practice, if that makes sense. Um, Can I ask a question? So I've been like discussing these things with quite a few people, like um, a graduate from last year, Wes, and like a few others, and, and discussing education and changing education. Um, and I've been reading a lot. Are there any other like resources or places that you're learning these things or um, things that really helped you grow and understand these areas even further? Because it's something I'm definitely curious about, um, especially as I was an adjunct for the first time this semester and already noticed that um, the greater like administration wants one thing and it just doesn't feel right for my students or appropriate um, to me personally. Um, and I'm trying to think about these things as well, but I'm just curious if you have any like extra resources or people that you're really looking to that I might not be aware of. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think I continuously return to um, Bell Hooks mostly because of she has this ability to write in a conversational way, which was really um, revolutionary to me coming out of Cranbrook. I, I think part of Cranbrook was like learning how to do the academic speak thing for better and worse. It allowed me to write grants when that was the audience, um, but I also lost the ability to like speak on a more grounded level. Um, I still return to folks also like um, like Fred Moulton um, and Silas Monroe. He just did the decolonial uh, sort of like school, Juan Carlos. Um, let me think. And then there are some amazing educator workshops. One of my favorites is Workshop Project um, from Jessica Wexler and Yasmin Khan. Uh, Jessica Wexler is the head at Cal or, or Pratt, uh, Yasmin Khan, Cal Arts. And they do an educator workshop in which they pose an unsolvable dilemma for each annual year. This past year was all access education. And so you have three days to create a curriculum in school uh, solving this unsolvable dilemma. And I think why it's important to engage in community spaces is because I could give you a reading list, but the most beneficial thing that I've learned is to surround myself by with educators who are at different phases of their careers um, and not particularly put value um, on one archetype over another, but instead to generate um, a community network. Um, where we can share readings and things of this. I'm also just a really slow synthesizer. And so I've always needed a dialogue space to understand or contend uh, with ideas. Um, I don't know if that's helpful. No, totally helpful. I'm definitely looking for like a greater community. So that pointing to those workshops is really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Barbara and Smith is great. I don't know if either of you know her, but Barbara Smith is like, gold um and let me just pop it in so one of our past let me get it uh, um camila janine rashid uh was one of our visiting uh speakers uh here at RISD and absolutely blew my brains out um with thinking about um, how school could be based in a scale of self-care. Um, and so I'm just gonna drop her talk in here, uh, which frankly is populated by one of the best reading lists you could ever imagine. And why I really appreciate this lecture from her as well is because it's, you're onboarded um, in a certain way that sometimes when you listen to a certain lecture, like if you don't know a certain person or a certain school of thought, you're already kicked out of the community. Like, conversation sphere. And then workshop project, which I mentioned uh, from Jessica Wexler and Yasmin Khan is awesome because it always results in a Wikipedia. And so you're always able to see what all the groups write, um, what their reading lists are, the old syllabi, everything is open source. So here's the Wikipedia for that as well. Thank you so much. Yeah. I have a question if no one else does also, but I've been talking a lot. Take it up, Alex, what's up? <laughs> oh, 
Um, have you seen Room of Silence? Yes. Um, and... So how do you, yeah, so basically mine was just like, how do you engage with that or how do you contend with that? Um, but for those That's... of you who don't know, I'll just, Room of Silence is like this 20 minute short video that was made by a RISD student um, about RISD. And so it's really talking to racialized people at RISD, racialized students there. Um, about things that have happened in critique and it's called room of silence because oftentimes like if you racialize and you present work at RISD but um, where I went to Micah for undergrad had very similar experiences um, and I think even non-ACAD people would agree that you present your work uh, if you're a racialized person it's a whole white room and a lot of times like crits are very very silent or very very quiet so this documentary is kind of discussing that if you haven't seen it I can drop the link in too yeah and so great great question um i also just linked up so that was before i formally joined um and so what i ended up linking up was a group of students formed something called RISD arc which is the RISD anti-racist racism coalition um in which they pro they set out a list of 11 demands to the school they worked with the office of uh, student uh equity and engagement on these things um but to sort of answer your question about how I, as a white male passing faculty, engage with the demands of students is first, number one, to actually listen to what they said. And so um, this coalition was formed um, following the murder of George Floyd. So we're running around about a year now. Um, each department individually gave a response to the set of student demands. Um, but as individual faculty, we didn't do much outside of that. Um, during a faculty meeting this fall, I, uh, thanks to Ramon, called out basically all of the faculty saying like, what the fuck have we done other than lip service? Uh, to, I oh, shit, this is being recorded. Um, but uh, let me make sure I'm more careful with my words. No, no, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> Okay. I'll, I'll make sure that that's removed. Uh, just say, um, say say remove that, and I'll remove that. Don't no no problem. But I think uh, what I ended up doing was like it's actually really important for white faculty to form like white faculty anti racism coalitions, and so I've worked together with department heads over the past uh, four months, and with larger uh, departments with inside RISD to understand where we have power to change. Uh, and respond to the demands, which some of which included like uh, divorcing from, you know, Providence police, which we just can't do and still be an accredited school. But it also included things like uh, tuition resets and uh, evaluation and hiring processes, these things we have power over. And so um, working with other faculty, um, we have a contract that's going to be negotiated next spring. And so over the summer and over this coming year, I've, again, sort of that idea of like organization, organized like-minded individuals together uh, to actually enact structural change to respond to some of these things. So how do we actually uh, ensure that ideas of inclusivity are being taught in the classroom and it's not just lip service? And so we do that through, uh, our evaluation and hiring processes, and we changed that through our, our contract. And so one of the things that I really didn't understand leaving graduate school was actually like, institutions are a governmental body. It's really simultaneously easy to organize with inside of them and very hard to enact structural change. And so there are moments where uh, faculty have immense power to uh, shift and change these things. Um, but one of the biggest powers, especially at RISD, lies in the students. 80% of RISD's uh, running costs is from student tuition. And so, <laughs> um, you know, I don't think I'm necessarily, number one, I'm not answering your question directly about how I have responded to the room of silence, other than some organization and labor uh, movement changes that I'm working on. But how I act to change that is um, by continuing to learn and to be very aware of my own body and bias inside of the space 
and to aim to not center myself inside of these conversations and ideally carve space inside of my studio where, you know, for very, for to be very blunt, you know, it can be difficult at RISD when you're one student inside of a classroom where no one else looks like you. And so how can we ensure that that isn't going to continue to operate so that it isn't um, all compounded into single individuals like that? And secondarily, what can the institution uh, do to support faculty's growth and understanding of these issues when we're not, we haven't been seeking it out? How can we force faculty to seek out these conversations and understandings? So I don't know if I'm really like, please like pressure back. I don't necessarily know if I'm getting at it other than like maybe like three pronged, which is like number one, I have to know when to step like move my body aside and say, I don't know, or I need to learn. And I'm sorry, like, like acknowledgement. And then how can I use my like team oriented organizational self to enact structural change? Um, and where are moments of opportunity for that inside of the institution? And then the opposite side of that is a big institutional problem, which is how do we uh, provide more accessible pathways to RISD uh, for a wider uh, body of individuals? Because the only ways that we live up to our values of being um, a forward facing school is through um, sort of all of these multi-tiered processes. Um, so I don't know if I directly- You did, no, you, you answered it. I just was very curious about that. That's just like, I like yeah. asking RISD people about, <laughs> about that video in particular. And so like, you know, very frankly, like two of the organization of RISD ARC were graphic design uh, students. So I feel very fortunate to have students, you know, RISD is a very demanding place the institution demands a lot from its faculty and students demand a lot from it. And I kind of love that because no one is complacent. Um, and again, that idea of uh, like change is a progressive force. Um, and so I think that dialogue between bodies um, helps move it forward, you know. And then like fingers crossed that like the labor organization uh, actually goes well because the other side of it is faculty meetings are freaking wild when topics, difficult topics get brought up. Words like respect begin to be thrown around and respect really just means like, I don't want you to speak to hurt my feelings. And so there's so many, you know, sort of like complexities at hand inside here. Um, but as sort of like a junior faculty, I'm like, you know what, who cares? Like, <laughs> I'll, I'll put my, like, like, let's, let's do this thing. And then, yeah, Kate, I can attach um, that file here right now. I also would say on bookshop.org is a really wonderful um, book purchasing website um, that works with local uh, booksellers. But I do have a copy. I think it's a good starter. Uh, for Bell Hooks, which is teaching to transgress. Um, and I say that because a lot of her future writing is referential uh, to this text. If I can find it. Won't let me include it from my. I, th I think I'm pretty sure I have the PDF. Uh, the other thing that you could do is you could you could e just email it to me. I'm 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 maybe I have the audio book. I think there's we posted a, a link to the PDF. Link. Yeah, all right, there you go. Yeah. I had a, qu a question that's going to completely derail the prior conversation, um, but. Cars are a, a huge part of your thing, and I was wondering how you got to VW and Euro cars. Because when I think of like tuner or stance culture, I think of like Honda or like Japanese uh, cars. So I was just like curious about what your path to VW was. Yeah, so um, I was like a Lego and Erector kid. Um, 
And I think this just had to do with me being able to physically understand how something operated. And so Legos, Legos and Erector sets quickly transitioned into mopeds, which quickly transitioned into me stealing my mom's car when I was like 14 and 15 to go driving. Um, and at the time in Minneapolis, there was just a really large Volkswagen scene and a lot of my friends were into it. You're right, I just had as many friends into the Japanese domestic market, JDM. Um, and I, I, the Volkswagen thing was kind of circumstance just because it was all, what all my friends drove. Um, and so my first car actually was a Honda. Uh, my second car then became a Volkswagen. I've, I've had a bunch of Volkswagen since um, and a couple of GMC big, big boy trucks. Um, but one of my uh, co owners of Lowered Values. We have a garage space in Val Valparaiso, uh, Illinois, just outside of Chicago, and it specializes in JDM cars as well. So uh, my uh, collaborator, Richard Contreras, really knows a lot more about them. So I don't know, I was just like circumstance. And then I was like, as soon as you drive a 1970s Volkswagen, the smell of it, um, the weird faux wood dash, you know, like it, it, I was just kind of sold at that point. Um, and I kind of loved the boxiness of it, if that makes sense. I just threw a question in the chat. Awesome, thanks, Ed. Uh, wondering if you could talk about the sort of pipeline of projects, order of operations you have going, oh gosh, yeah, balancing different modes of your practice. How things, how far in advance do I plan versus teaching? versus exploration? How do you make sure that none of this eclipses each other and you make sure that they uh, feed back into one another? This is such a great question. It's something one of my grads interviewed me uh, for his teaching certificate and he was like, how do you balance your professional and teaching practice? And I was like, I don't know. And if someone inside of your class tells you a good answer, can you please tell me? Um, because I think one of the hardest things I've had is understanding boundary. Um, and what I mean by that is like, I care very deeply about the individuals inside my classroom, not only in terms of their performance inside of uh, the classroom space, but also like, are they happy? Are they eating well? You know, are they sleeping? Um, and so I, boundaries for me um, in terms of teaching and my professional practice are very fluid. Um, in terms of like pipeline and order of operations, I just usually say yes to everything. And almost always those start to stack up on top of each other. So right now I'm speaking with you all. I'm in the middle of finals at RISD. I'm preparing another lecture for another school. And I'm also doing an identity system for a new space in Providence, which has a timeline of like two weeks. And then I'm also working with a gallery in Texas on a large vinyl installation. I don't, I don't know how to juggle it. So I think this is a terrible way of saying like, if you find yourself working with communities and with spaces that you love or support, it never really starts to feel like work. Um, but ways that I've found to make boundaries for myself is like, I'm very, very sacred about um, morning ritual and weekend rituals um, and that for me the only way of creating a sustainable uh, practice has been uh, to actually find a uh, weekly like schedule and so like I go grocery shopping the same day every week during the same two hours I clean my house at the same time every week at the same time you know six days a week from five to seven or eight I'll be at the gym um, and so by having dedicated sort of like all the other stuff to different, um, like assigned times is about the only way I can manage it. But I honestly don't know how teachers, like I have this conversation with Paul all the time, like, Paul, how do you manage queer archive? and being graduate program director and you know your teaching practices and he's like well I just like don't you know like he talks about boundaries in a different way um, but I think for each it's very individual and I'm someone that uh, kind of thrives under endurance 
um, which doesn't work for everyone. And so for me, I'm happiest when there's a few balls in the air. Um, and I feel like my body is moving a lot. Uh, but that also means that like a couple of weeks out of the year, I completely log off and I don't do anything. Like actually being able to say no and rest becomes very important. Um, so I don't have a good answer to how people balance because I don't think I balance well. Um, yeah, I, I definitely don't balance well either. Um, and I'm just, I'm, I'm worried about it in the future, but um, I, I, I think it's reassuring to hear that there's ways to establish, you know, I, I have a very weird routine right now, but it's, it's a good reminder to, that establishing that sort of stuff can make that unbalanced stuff at least with, have bounds on either side of it. Yeah, and then you sort of asked, like, how do these things feed into one another? And one of, you know, leaving graduate school and something I continue to contend with is anytime I read a book or listen to a podcast or go to a show or watch a lecture, the first thought through my mind is how does this apply to either my practice or um, studio? And in that way, graduate school kind of killed my ability to be entertained. Um, and it was actually a process of like remembering that it doesn't have to feed each other and it's important for us to be a well-rounded, complex, faceted individual um, with the trust that these things actually do start to inform each other, even if it's years in the future. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know if that also sort of addresses it, but I don't know if you guys sense it too, but that feeling of like whatever you're doing has to be productive in some sort of sense, like it has to apply to whatever you're doing in the studio. That's been a very hard voice in my head to kill. Um, or not, that was, that was a harsh word to like diminish or contend with. And so it's been a sort of practice of like acknowledging that voice and then asking it to be a little bit quieter, you know, to be like a little bit hippie and cheesy. I definitely feel that that was something that was kind of taken over, taking over for me after my undergrad, which was like just trying to like separate what I did extracurricularly or as a hobby from like what I did for work and being able to tone down. But I kind of just wanted to, to ask you about like your vinyl practice because um, that's something that I've been doing in the five years between undergrad and coming here. Um, I was kind of hoping to do it a little bit more here. I, I didn't really get to, but I, I was just wondering how you got into that and how that's been informing your practice. Yeah, I love uh, like fellow vinyl connoisseur, the smell of it, you know, the feel of it. Um, so I, was like first exposed to most studio processes, I'd say through cars. Um, so like vinyl being applied to a car surface was kind of the first thing. And then I like stupidly didn't really think about super graphics for like the entirety of any of my undergrad or like the fact that these were translatable. Um, but I've always been, now I could tell you that I've been always interested in tools used to perform letters. Um, so whether or not it's like a cut material or a chiseled brush um, or like a pointed pen um, and how those change sort of the surface of it. And so um, going before going to Cranbrook, um, I worked like at a sign shop. Um, I did all of the store signage for the record store I worked for. And so I had a fair amount of like hands-on apprenticeship uh, and different sign making techniques during that time. Um, so I'd say that was sort of like my pathway in. And then a at a certain point I was like, well, what if it's the entire wall? And what if it's like, it takes me 19 hours in a row to install? Um, and I think when I was at Cranbrook, um, Liz Cohen was like in the photo department. I was very influenced by her body work um, set uh, working with cars and performance of uh, body inside of photographic spaces. And I did get a fair amount of comments akin to 
Um, if you're familiar with Castles, uh, who is a, perform a, a trans performer artist uh, who sculpts clay and body. And so I was getting a lot of comments about like, well, why don't you make, I, I wasn't really getting comments like directly said this way, but it was sort of like, well, what if you made like, like labor work about your body, you know? Cause like we see that <laughs> you <laughs> look different than how you say you are. Um, and so uh, I think at a moment it was a way of like trying to understand all of these uh, complexities and like knowledges together in a moment. Um, sorry to take up so much space, but I'm curious too, what were your strategies um, after graduating? Obviously that's coming up for a lot of us, um, it feels a little, probably a little different than other scenarios that when I've graduated in the past because of COVID, but what were your strategies for dealing with that transition and with the grief and grieving process that comes with that? I think that's a really good question. Um, my general um, emotional tactic to moments of grievance is to distance myself as far as possible. I'm not good at uh, contending um, with emotions and that's because I have a hard time synthesizing what they mean and applying them to a social context. And so advice I would have um, at this point as you uh, exit, um, is probably advice that I was also told, which is to uh, invest in your final couple of weeks in your community here. And to the best of your ability, remember to be humans in a room together. Um, I remember while I showed utopic images of my cohort, moments were not always utopic with my cohort. Um, and so I think one of the things I'm frustrated about is not having that moment of reckoning with them you know, while we were still bodies in space together. Um, we've had those moments outside of school, um, but you get so wrapped up in your thesis and it's the same thing I'm telling my grads right now, which is remember to give time to one another. Like this is your time to be selfish, but it's also one of your last times to be humans in this making environment together. Um, and so I sense your question was twofold about exiting school. And so one of my recommendations is uh, for you to carve out space to be a community together before you find your separate ways and to come to resolutions about grievances or uh, excitements that might have happened. These things spawn and you don't want to let them fester. Um, and the other side of that is, I mean, I don't, I can't think of the right word for it, but I mean, leaving Cranbrook, I sent out like 50 applications, I think. It's just a mountain load that you have to actually do. And it's the same conversation I'm having right now with my seniors who are very fearful about the turbulent job market and sort of a remembrance of, it's like practice. And so each application you do, it doesn't get easier. It never becomes less exposing feeling um, but it does become, uh, you do get better at it. Um, I don't think I directly answered your question. Um, also, just, can I ask one last addition to it that maybe it's like a part you could talk to too, is like grieving, having like the studio space. Like I want to find that again here, obviously, but, um, it's definitely like that as well but I don't want to take up too much time. So you can also not answer that if you don't want to. Um, I'm going to do a slight deferral, which might be my tone of the day. It, it will be important for you to grieve the loss of space. Cranbrook is beautiful. I sense most of you felt that magic. Um, my cohort would talk about how the ghosts are always present there. Um, and so, I think it's an understanding of kind of that moment in time. But the other side or what you're asking about is a studio space. And to be honest with you, in my time outside of Cranbrook, I have come to understand what a privileged position it is to even have a studio or be able to engage with a studio practice. Because in order to engage with the pursuit of that nature, it means that one's safety 
and basic needs have at least been met. And so by that point, you're already operating with such privilege. Um, and so I think to be honest, I've actually worked hard to dismantle the idea of a studio practice inside of my head. Um, and instead, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know how else to say that, right? I've thought a lot about how uh, the conditions in order to even reach that point, um, I wasn't frankly aware of them being, like entering Cranbrook, you know, these just weren't dialogues that were happening. Um, and I've come to understand that more so in my time outside of school. So I'm not directly answering your question about um, the grieving of the space or the loss of space, but I think it is important for you to understand what a uh, practice means to you and that a space doesn't necessarily provide the conditions for that to exist, if that makes sense. No, that's actually super helpful because I've been feeling guilty about that. Like, oh, like I have to find a space, I have to find a space that's accessible. Like, will that space actually be helpful for me since it like going into the studio can be painful for my body? Like I've been thinking about those things. So it actually like alleviates a lot of stress and pressure I've been putting on myself. So thank you. I mean, I'm coming to you from our bedroom, right? Like we live in a tiny studio in Providence, Rhode Island. And when we re went remote teaching, it's really hard to have, my wife also teaches at RISD. So like we had to, and to be really honest, when we went remote, the discrepancy amongst faculty became very clear on screen for the students. And so we had to do our best um, to, <laughs> uh, make it look better than it might be. And this isn't to like say like we're hard off or anything like that, but like we are two young educators who took out massive amounts of debt to go to private school, um, who are, who've worked at public institutions since leaving um, and are still contending with the realities. I love the decision I made. Cranbrook was very foundational for me. It was some of the fondest two years of my life, um, but it was a decision that I made and I'm dealing with not dealing, but contending with the uh, that choice. And so for me, I became to realize like the studio can exist anywhere. Um, the collaborators can exist anywhere. Ideas of coming together, being in space, um, really with the Zoom thing have meant new things. And um, part of my understanding has been shaped more so by like my, who I surround myself in, with in the studio uh, than the space itself. That helps. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, well, it, does anyone else have a last question before we? Uh, I do, but I want to be respectful of time. So. The floor is yours. You have time. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm just really curious about how you're thinking about critique, both when you were at Cranbrook and how you've sort of rethought and reframed potentially, um, because you know kind of how it is here and then really thinking about it as a teacher um, and a lot of the things that we talked about. Uh, those were some of the fondest ritual moments for me at Cranbrook um, and so, I mean, I'm sure you all have felt this like review can simultaneously be like the best thing in the world. And then there are other moments where you're like, oh my God, what is happening? What is being said? Um, and so I'm assuming it's the same sort of like cold read scenario. Um, and so I went to Cranbrook for that review structure. And so during my time there, um, I really leaned into it. Um, and enjoyed the cold crit uh, sort of style that we do. And then calling work, um, I think Elliot used to use the word crisis. I don't know if, if you still, still do, do Elliot. Yeah. yeah, but you know, kind of calling in, in into works um, possible like lapses or shortcuts. Um, and so when I began teaching at VCU, I thought that was like the best, like an only way to do it. And when I started teaching, I had a really hard time understanding the difference between a graduate uh, level education need and an undergraduate level education need. And 
I started um, to play with the idea of like different types of reviews or different types of critiques depending on the needs and the like students uh, present. And so um, your question is sort of like related to like how did my understanding of like crit and review change? I think like the first thing was I felt very strongly leaving Cranbrook that the word critique should be dismissed. Um, critique um, has a lot of baggage inside of it. And for me, the purpose of it is to initiate a dialogue about what factors are at hand, um, what unseen circumstances occur and what potentials do we have to move the work forward. And so inside of my own class, Room, we almost never uh, review or have a dialogue on final work. I always uh, schedule uh, the review of work like the class period before so students have the ability to adapt and respond to what's being said, which I think is the most valuable thing for critique in an undergraduate sphere is for a student to listen to what's understood, said, understand what they agree and disagree with and take action upon it. And so it almost becomes less about the dialogue space itself, but an individual's ability to listen, observe and take action moving forward. The other thing from Cranbrook that I still haven't quite figured out how to enact, especially in, in undergrad space where participation looks like many different things for many different people is how do you convince them that generously engaging with your peers work will actually make you a stronger designer yourself. And that was the special moment about Cranbrook, which is like, sometimes my colleagues work would be something that I knew like nothing about. I had to do like a decent amount of like research or leveling up. But that is also a potential like hard moment too, which is um, when we diverse divorce someone entirely from their work, we remove a big aspect of it, which is someone's body of work, that individual body performing the work um, and the chorus of voices behind it. And so I think that's been maybe one thing that's been shifted, or at least in my experience, which is I think I'm best suited to see a trajectory over time. Um, and so in understanding that it's simultaneously really good for one to be nimble and flexible enough to be able to jump in, see the symbols or communication structures at hand and be able to respond to it. But the other side of that is what were the movements that existed before this piece that led to this and how might we understand a trajectory moving forward. Um, and so I think there's a really big difference between being a student in a review dialogue and being a teacher or facilitator of it, where you're almost more concerned about uh, shaping a conversation to become uh, future facing. Um, I don't know if I'm necessarily getting at the question, Lindsay, but I, I, I feel like tricky about uh, the cold read thing. And I've been reading a lot of like how dancers um, and choreographers like Liz Lerman, for instance, does like really wonderful uh, critique structures in which one's body is acknowledged. And I think that for graphic design, it's actually really important for us to do that um, acknowledgement. Yeah, we, we actually right? like included- Who's speaking and who isn't speaking. Yeah, we, oh, we included Liz Lerman this year. I'm oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, yeah, and so and that's, that's, great. that's part of it, right? I mean, we're really thinking about all of these things. And I also asked it for all of the students who want to be educators or, or who are educators as well. I think going into every scenario and thinking about this, and I've been thinking about it so much during the pandemic as well of having to teach over Zoom um, in different levels of undergrad as well. And how, uh, yeah, I mean, just the, different levels of comfort of students speaking up and how beneficial that is or isn't. I was thinking about, you really articulated something that was kind of floating around in my brain of that I have been shifting some of my critiques for juniors that I've been teaching this semester of, um, it doesn't help them to look at the final thing. It helps them to look before and, uh, you know, just, I just wanted to hear another perspective of how other people are thinking about these things as well. 
That's, but thank you. Absolutely, the tool that facilitates dialogue is a big one. And I think uh, this pandemic and moving online has actually has a lot of benefits. So for instance, we started to use things like Slack. We use another tool called Miro, which is sort of like a collaborative whiteboard space. We have started to use Arena a ton. Um, and all of these different modes of communication and dialogue elicit different types of communication inside of a community cohort. And to see how my juniors like pop off on each other's Slack, my, my, my grads don't, but on Arena, they definitely do. And so it's just a matter of creating a multimodal experience Experience, which I think is the other thing. We don't te talk about teaching as an active experience design. Teaching is absolutely an active experience design. Um, and so uh, one of the helpful things for me thinking about how you frame a review is like, how would a student experience this? And then what do I, what do they need from the conversation? But also what do I as an educator need from the conversation? Because if we entirely base it on what a student needs, we also forget to fill ourselves back up. And sometimes it's important for me to just see all their faces. And I'll be, be really honest with them. Like, I just need to see a human faces, you know? Um, but other times like uh, asynchronous Slack conversation works really well because those who might feel more timid to speak up feel really confident, like popping off in chat. Um, and so one of the beauties I think of teaching online is like, I have noticed students who didn't speak at all last year, all of a sudden finding their voice or finding ways of uh, engaging in new dialogue ways. Of course, there's been plenty of trickery too. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's exactly, I mean, I just, also I think there's some isolation in teaching on Zoom that you just wanna hear what other folks are experiencing and how it's going. The sharing of knowledge among students has been very hard on Zoom. It, it's much different than when you're in a studio together. I think that's very true. Um, and so one of the biggest things I've been reminded of is I, I say that I trust my students all the time, but do I actually, am I actually giving them space to just be students together without me in the room? Um, and it's part of like me just liking to see what they're up to, but also recognizing that like that space happens inside the classroom. Why am I not making it inside of the digital arena? We're also using things like Hubs, which is an open source tool from Mozilla, um, where everyone's just an avatar. It's a gaming engine. I use it for experience design. We built out a classroom. They did world building inside of it. Uh, really beautiful. But we've also done a couple things in Minecraft, a couple things in Animal Crossing. It's really about, you know, there are pretty amazing tools to form community outside of Zoom. And I think uh, uh, I've had the ability to test them because I teach experience design where it's like, okay, to do those weird things. But, you know, to be honest at RISD, we didn't have any sort of online management system, like learning management system. So it's just been kind of like, well, <laughs> like radical imagination. How about you try it? Um, like you guys know what's best. Um, but I think the beauty of it is like students will be very keen to tell you what doesn't work, <laughs> at least in, in, in my, my, my spot. Okay, um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, thank you very, very much for spending the time with us. It's really great to, um, to reconnect and to, uh, yeah, I'm still processing, still processing, but I really wanna thank you very, very much. Yeah, thank you all for like spending a couple hours. Um, hopefully it was mildly coherent, but I think the best thing that I can say right now is like you've at least connected one other person inside of the Cranbrook community to yourselves right now. Um, I'll drop second life crit. Oh man, absolutely. Here's my email. I'm very easy to find via email, although I am almost never uh, active on Instagram or other types of social media. Um, and I think like the best thing I can say to you right now is like, you now know me and I now know you a little bit and let's keep this conversation and dialogue moving forward. I'm best over coffee one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. <laughs> That's super generous of you. Um, all right, the, uh, thanks a lot. And you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll connect with you um, via text uh, later today. Awesome, sounds great. I'm in the studio, so if it takes me a moment to respond, oh, don't yeah. be offended. <laughs> th th thanks again, Kelsey. And, and, yeah, for uh, sure.
Speak to you soon. All right. Thank you. Stay well, everyone. Yeah, bye, y'all.